Hello everyone. Today in this video we're going to talk about lumbar punctures, how they're performed in neuroradiology, why you might do them, and how to optimize your technique. Lumbar punctures in general are part of uh, spinal punctures, which are done for a variety of reasons. That includes punctures in the lumbar spine as well as the cervical spine. Uh, myelography is a special subset of spinal punctures where you inject a contrast agent for contrast myelography. We'll talk about that a little bit later in another video. As part of any discussion about lumbar puncture, you have to think about what some of the general indications for spinal puncture are. Typically, they're being done to enable diagnosis, so you need some uh, CSF measurements to make a diagnosis, particularly if you're talking about a patient who are suspected of meningitis or uh, CSF malignancy or uh, spread into the left meninges. Some abnormalities of CSF pressure require a lumbar puncture, such as evaluation for pseudotumor or idiopathic intracranial hypertension or CSF leak. And then finally, you may be doing an evaluation to see if someone improves after a lumbar puncture in the case of normal pressure hydrocephalus. Uh, you can do lumbar punctures for imaging. So in those cases, you'll inject contrast to do myelography or cisternography to follow. Uh, you might want to place a lumbar drain to provide long-term CSF drainage, or you might do intrathecal chemotherapy. So those are all considerations you might do a lumbar puncture for. Now, you have to keep in mind which ones are emergencies, because those are the ones you might have to come in uh, after hours or overnight, and you might need to do them emergently rather than wait. The true emergencies, uh, in my mind, are an emergent myelogram in a patient who's about to go to the OR. So if you have caudal equina syndrome, you can't get an MRI for whatever reason. Maybe you have metal uh, implanted or metal near the eye or an implant that's not MR compatible. Uh, or if you have a pacemaker that's MR incompatible. And, uh, but in those cases, I would typically do it only if the patient's about to go to the OR. When the ordering attending doctor asks you for it, like typically, then I will go ahead and do those. Uh, a lot of times, like if it's a resident or a medical student who's calling and asking for it, uh, I usually ask to speak to the attending if we're going to call someone in to do it uh, overnight uh, because that's an emergency. Now, there are also a number of urgent indications. So the diagnosis of meningitis is relatively urgent. If someone has suspected uh, IIH uh, or pseudotumor and they're having visual changes, uh, these are relatively urgent, but uh, a lot of times they don't have to be done overnight and they can wait until in the morning. This is a picture I drew on a whiteboard one day. I was trying to draw a lumbar spine and uh, here's you know, the transverse process and the spinous process. I was trying to draw the interlaminar space and uh, the residents got a little creative and made this into a lumbar puncture man. But here is a general principle it kind of shows where you're going to go. Uh, you need to try to put your needle in the mouth of this uh, lumbar puncture monster. For a lumbar puncture, when you're starting, uh, positioning the patient is kind of key, and you'll, you'll see different ways that people do this. I do my lumbar punctures in fluoroscopy with the patient prone and slightly decubitus, so I'll have them rotate about uh, you know, 5 to 15 degrees. If you're doing it in CT, you can do it either lateral decubitus or prone. And then starting out, you want to image to find a suitable approach, mark the skin, clean the skin, do your local anesthesia, and uh, then you'll choose your needle in advance until you get uh, CSF return. And as you're doing this, you're going to image intermittently as, as needed. So as you gain more experience and easier procedures, maybe you're imaging only a little bit. Uh, at the beginning, you might be imaging a lot. Now, as I mentioned, when you're positioning the patient, like some people choose to position the patient straight prone, uh, this, uh, in this maneuver, the spinous process can be a little bit more in the way. I prefer to rotate the patient about 5 or 15 degrees. If you have the patient pull one knee slightly towards their chest, that usually puts a little bit of uh, tilt in their spine. And what that will do is I will rotate the spinous process uh, to one side and kind of get it out of the way. Needle types are something that you definitely need to know about. The most common spinal needle that you'll see is called a quanky needle, and it has a beveled tip like so. So this is a cutting needle, and it has an open, uh, the opening for fluid is in the side here, so it's in the bevel here. 
And uh, you'll see those used the most commonly because it allows steering. They're the simplest to use. There is evidence that they have a raised risk of CSF leak after the procedure, but some of the benefits, uh, especially the ability to steer, make most radiologists continue to use cutting needles. A traumatic needle, such as the Whitaker and Sprott needles, you'll see they have a little bit blunter tip and then the hole for uh, CSF extraction or for injection is on the side. So you see the Whitaker has a, a side hole here and the Sprott has a side hole here. And uh, those are designed to kind of spread the dura as you enter and they have a lower risk of leak, but they're a little bit more challenging to use, which is why we use them less often. Needle length is an important consideration as well. Um, most commonly, you're going to use a 3.5 inch or nine centimeter needle. That's gonna come in the vast majority of lumbar puncture kits. In patients who are a little bit larger, uh, you may have to use a larger needle, like a 12 centimeter or five inch needle. In the truly largest patients, you may have to use a seven inch or 17 uh, centimeter needle. Now, needle size is uh, also a consideration. So needle gauge or the thickness of the needle um, many times, like the ones that we use have a 20 gauge needle that comes in the kit. It has a yellow hub. There's some advantages of a 20 gauge needle. You get the fastest fluid collection. The needle will bend the least when you're putting it in. But as you use a larger needle, the risk of CSF leak is a little bit larger. A 22 gauge needle is a nice needle for most common procedures. It has a kind of an intermediate risk of leak. You get a nice balance of steering and rigidity and uh, still being able to collect fluid. You'll sometimes see people use 25 gauge needles. Most often that's not for CSF collection because it's simply too slow to measure CSF pressure and to, to collect fluid. Uh, but the risk of leak is the lowest and you can use it for myelography if you're simply going to be injecting contrast. So 22 gauge needle, like I said, is kind of my go-to needle for the vast majority of my spinal procedures. Now this is an initial image that you might see when you place the patient on fluoro and there's a couple of things that uh, I'll point out. You can see a little wisp of the 12 ribs here. You can see that there's five lumbar vertebral bodies and uh, so you see the 12 rib and you can kind of number your vertebral bodies. You kind of see where you are uh, here. Uh, I've numbered them along the side and then you can see the interlaminar spaces like here I've outlined one with a dashed red line there. So you can see the spinous process uh, blocks it a little bit. And that's why I'm saying you might have some advantage of uh, making the patient a little bit prone. Uh, but here are the sort of the landmarks that you're looking for. Now, something that you'll note is the interlaminar space uh, for a level is a little bit below the vertebral body and can even be above the vertebral body to level below. So here at L1, for instance, this is the spinous process of L1. The interlaminar space for L1, L2 is over the L2 vertebral body here. So just keep in mind you, uh, you're a little bit lower than the disc interval uh, that you're looking at. So you can use an image like this to help you choose a level. And uh, it's best to go over a vertebral body because that way you have no risk of getting into the disc. If you go a little too deep, you'll just hit the bone, uh, which is a little bit better. Typically, it's better to go a little bit lower. So nice target levels are L2, L3, or L3, L4. As you get to L5, S1, the thecal sac can be a little bit smaller and it can be a little bit more challenging unless you have an MR or CT knowing that they have a robust thecal sac there. Again, this is just a review of the things that we're talking about. Uh, so it's, it's good to review prior imaging if you have it. If you have a CT or an MR, that can be super helpful because you can see the position of the conus. You can get an idea for how much degenerative disease is present and get an idea for any hardware that's there. You wanna go through a level where you can see some interlaminar space. The conus is almost always above the L1, L2 disc. Uh, so you can usually go safely at L2, L3 or below. Uh, sometimes in patients who have really terrible degenerative disease, you can go at L1, L2 if you safely know the conus is higher. And as I mentioned, like L5, S1 has prominent epidural fat pretty often. So that can kind of limit your ability to go in there. Now here we'll talk a little bit about needle placement. So once you've viewed your total lumbar spine or kind of the whole lumbar spine, you can collimate in over your target to decrease your radiation dose. And you'll end up with an image that looks like this. Like here you have the spinous process. Here you have a magnified uh, your interlaminar space. 
And then here's your needle and you can see a little cubicle area here. That's the hub of the needle. And then you see the needle kind of angled off to the, uh, to the patient's right here or the right side of the image rather. And uh, what you want to try to do is make your needle uh, appear as point-like as possible. So you're really going to just kind of go straight down the barrel of the needle and try to minimize the angulation of that needle. And as I mentioned already, you can image as needed uh, as you would make adjustments to the needle. Now I'll give you a little bit of an overview of needle steering. Now, as I mentioned, these quanky needles, they have a bevel and the bevel has the hole cut out in the side. And then the hubs of these needles have a notch. And typically the notch is on the same side as the bevel. And these needles have a natural tendency to steer away from the notch. So if you just advance this with no pressure uh, for one direction or another, it's going to naturally cut into the tissue just a little bit and kind of steer away from the notch. So you can take advantage of that as you're trying to steer your needle a little bit. Uh, so here I've just made a little animation to show you what I mean. Uh, as you advance this needle, what's going to happen is uh, if you want to steer the needle tip down, what you can do is put a little gentle pressure on the hub up and uh, then take advantage of the natural steering of the needle tip. And what you'll get is your needle is going to steer a little bit down. So if you're going to do the same thing, then uh, you want to go the other direction, then you can rotate your needle around and uh, then apply pressure on the hub the other way but take advantage of that natural steering of the needle. You can also use the bevel of the needle to help you avoid obstacles. So I've drawn a pretty a cylindrical, like a fake looking bone here, but you can imagine if you have your needle and uh, so just imagine that this bone is the lamina and as you're coming up to it, uh, you know, you hit right into it and the needle kind of bonks into it. If the bevel is in this position, what will happen is it will anchor in the bone right there and you're not going to be able to get, to get past that. Uh, what you can do is you can pull back a little bit and rotate your needle. Uh, so rotate your needle 180 degrees, get your bevel faced uh, towards the object you're trying to avoid. And then uh, as you advance it, what will happen is uh, you're gonna come up to the bone and because the bevel is faced this way, uh, it's gonna allow the needle to slip right over the top and uh, kind of go over that bone, so it's going to help you uh, help you go past it there. So it's a nice way of avoiding an obstacle there. If you're doing everything you can, so uh, you're going to keep advancing, and uh, as you do more of these, you'll kind of get a notion for how deep you have to go to get CSF. You'll get a little bit of a better feel of that resistance as you go through the ligamentum flavum. Uh, the ligamentum flavum typically feels like the rubber stopper in the top of the lidocaine vial. And uh, what, what you're going to want to do is uh, you can do some provocative maneuvers to try to get CSF. You can rotate the bevel of the needle towards the head and that uh, sometimes will help you get uh, CSF. You can have the patient do some provocative maneuvers to kind of increase their pressure. Either have them bear down or Valsalva, have them cough, or if you're in a, in a room that can tilt the bed, you can tilt the head of the bed up to kind of increase the intracranial pressure. If you're still having trouble, you can uh, check with lateral imaging to check the depth. If you have a C-arm, you can uh, rotate your C-arm into a cross-table position. Uh, if not, you can do a lateral radiograph, or, or you can even rotate the patient into lateral. It is safe to uh, rotate the patient with a needle in their back. That, that's typically not a problem. Once you uh, have started to get CSF, so you'll periodically check, and once you're seeing CSF in the hub of your needle, uh, now it's going to be time to collect your uh, collect your CSF. I don't measure pressure all the time, but the times you should measure pressure is uh, if there's any concern for abnormal pressure, so the history uh, concerning for pseudotumor. Uh, if they're concerned for CSF leak, then you want to measure the pressure because the pressure may be low, or you want to do it any time it's specifically requested. Uh, first time diagnosis of meningitis, sometimes the pressure can be useful as well because uh, the pressure can often be high. At that point, if desired, you can proceed by placing a lumbar drain, uh, doing intrathecal chemotherapy, or injecting your contrast for a myelogram. To measure pressure, uh, just to give you a little bit of how that's done, uh, intracranial pressure is measured in centimeters of water. Uh, which, interestingly, is actually very close to millimeters of mercury if you do the conversion, but uh, we report it in centimeters of water. 
what you'll do is you'll attach the uh, connector tubing and uh, the manometer and then you can position the patient for measurement. Now we do most of ours in prone because the patients are, are in prone. The most accurate way to measure pressure is probably in decubitus because it's taking the pressure off of the patient's abdomen. Uh, so if you put them in decubitus, that gives you the most accurate. And what you're gonna do is want to attach the uh, manometer and let the CSF go up to the level of uh, where it naturally uh, lands, uh, where it's not changing anymore. Uh, when we're doing it prone, um, there's a couple of ways you can measure the pressure. If you're using a long enough connector tubing, you can hold your, your three-way stopcock at the level of the spine. Uh, another way to do it is to hold your stopcock at the level of the needle and then add the needle length. So if you're using a nine centimeter needle, you can kind of add that uh, needle length. Uh, or you can attach your manometer directly to the needle. Uh, this is a little bit of a tricky maneuver because you want to make sure you don't move the needle uh, within the patient uh, because you can lose your access to the thecal sac. So that can be a little tricky, but uh, it, is, it is possible. Just generally speaking, measurements of intracranial pressure are probably only accurate to within a couple of centimeters. So uh, the variations in these, in these measurements, I mean, they're, they're probably well within the margin of error for this technique. The difference between a pressure of 19 and 21 is, is probably not real. Uh, so you don't have to be super accurate about this. Once you've uh, measured your pressure, then you want to proceed with collecting fluid. Most of the time you're going to collect four tubes of fluid, about two to three milliliters per tube to get a total of about eight to 10 milliliters. If you know which tests are going to be performed, then you can speak to your lab about how much fluid is needed for each test and that can give you specific information. In patients who have a diagnosis where more fluid is needed, usually this means a intracranial malignancy where they're looking for leptomeningeal spread, unusual inflammatory conditions uh, where they're looking for, uh, I don't know, say for instance, sarcoidosis or something like that, and they want to do uh, flow cytometry or, cell or uh, kind of more detailed testing, unusual infections, you want to collect more fluid, now, when patients have intracranial hypertension, you can collect more fluid as a therapeutic measure to actually bring the pressure down. I typically will collect up to 20 to 25 milliliters of fluid in, in patients uh, for these reasons. Uh, if it's a pressure condition, you can measure the closing pressure. Uh, so you can do that as well. Um, I'll point out that there are a few tests that require special tubes. Some of the tests for Alzheimer's disease uh, where they're measuring tau protein will use a special tube because tau protein collects along the side of the conventional tubes. So you want to use whatever special tube is necessary for those tests. So just be aware that that's a consideration. Finally, I'll give you a little bit of a note about a lumbar drain. Lumbar drains are long-term, well not long-term, but intermediate terms over a couple of days, measures of uh, reducing the CSF pressure. Usually that's done when the patient has a dural leak, uh, often after an intradural procedure, so a spinal procedure where the dura had to be opened, or a sinus procedure or a mastoid procedure. Lowering the pressure uh, can give this a chance to heal. Typically you can do these uh, just like an LP, only you'll use a larger needle with a curved tip, uh, it's a special needle type called a TUI needle. Typically those are larger needles and they often come in a lumbar puncture drain kit. And these, these can be 14 or 17 gauge needles. Once you get into the endothecal space, uh, you just pass the catheter through this TUI needle into the subarachnoid space. You want to direct the tip towards the head. A lot of times you'll work in conjunction with your neurosurgery department and they will place the, uh, the lumbar drain. A uh, pro tip about that is uh, when you're placing your lumbar drain, you want to be very careful not to pull the drain back. Uh, because if you pull the drain back, you can actually shear off the tip of the drain with the sharp tip of the needle. So if you're having any problems with tip positioning, the safest thing to do is to remove the whole apparatus, needle and all, and start again. Thanks for watching our video today. Up next, we'll have a video about myelograms. We'll talk about uh, indications for myelograms and how to proceed after you've done a lumbar puncture. Thank you for watching our video today. If you enjoyed it, I hope you'll check out our other videos on our channel. Click here to subscribe or check out our website on learnerradiology.com.